Hello, I'm Bill Curtis. Street gangs. The name conjures up images of young men, turf wars, and violent crime. But an increasing number of adolescent women are entering this dangerous world of gangs. Today, over 65,000 young women call themselves gangster girls, and their lives are often brutal and short. On this episode of Inside Story, we travel the streets of the Los Angeles Barrio with several young women who have been drawn into this violent lifestyle, often by the age of 11. The gangs provide these young women with recognition, respect, and most importantly, protection from the crime that penetrates the neighborhoods they call home. I have a chemical imbalance, the shrink told me. I don't know where it started or how it came to be, but she said something. If I was a guy and there was a girl like me, you know, knowing the attitude and how, I, how so much I'm representing where I'm from, I wouldn't f with her because that's a girl that'll end up, you know, setting you up getting you all, you know, like, yeah, baby doll, I'll go out with you. And then, boom, her homeboys come right around the corner to blast your ass because she just done set you up. That's the kind of shit I was doing. The man didn't want to give me his money, so I just looked at him and put it towards his his penis and then turned around and shot him. Girls can do anything they want, you know? They can be down just like you can. And we can sit there and, you know, we can go blasting just like you can. And, you know, you show him what's up. Hey, you're just a little girl. I'm like, no, f that. I ain't no little girl. You want to get down, you want to talk sh okay, let's get down. Los Angeles is the place these gangster girls call home. It's the city with the largest gang population in the country. A drive through L.A. County will take you through 1,300 different gang neighborhoods, according to the L.A. Sheriff's Department. Typical of these is an area just six minutes from downtown. Local gang members refer to the neighborhood as Vicky's Town. The name will never appear on any official map of the area, but unofficially, Vicky's Town is this residential section of Boyle Heights, a largely poor and Hispanic area. These 10 residential blocks provide the hangouts and provoke the shootouts for the 30 or so teenagers who make up the Vicky's Town gang. He's trying to take away her toy and do it on a face well. and show off. Boom! <laughs> Two of the gang's most active girls are sisters. Shy Girl is 19. Her real name is Muao. She's been active in the gang since she was 13. Her older sister, Wendy, is the one who brought her into the gang. Wendy's original gang name is Crazy, and this is her turf. It says Eastside Vicky's Town, and my homeboy Shady Drifter. Red, and and who wrote that? It looked nasty. And some girls that don't know how to write. When you write on the walls, it's like showing your turf. This is my neighborhood. If you don't write up anything in your neighborhood, ain't nobody gonna know it's your neighborhood. Then they're gonna go write up their neighborhood in your neighborhood, then it's gonna make it seem like if it's their neighborhood. Wendy's matter-of-fact descriptions honest. provide a chilling insight into the mindset of a gang girl. There's an incident where in the corner right there, we were hanging out there, and um, I was pregnant, and they were shooting at us right here in this lot, and everybody turned around and jumped on me because I was pregnant, and everybody that jumped over my stomach got hit. I'm going to take you to another place where they shot and killed my cousin. Rest in peace. I was jumped in this corner right here. My cousin got shot and he died right here. And that's where Moal got shot. And I was trying to tell her not to get off my car and she <laughs> refused and ended up throwing herself out of the car just to um, spray can and cross out somebody, some other neighborhood. They started shooting. I was yelling at her to get in the car. They were at a close range. And um, it was this corner here. It was she's spraying on this corner right here. And she's riding up Vicky's town, spraying them out. And as a matter of fact, there goes the rival neighborhoods right there. And they came from across the street at this here. And they started shooting at us. 
And those there are rival gang members. Next to Vicky's town is a hilly area, free of gang affiliation, where Wendy has always gone to get away. I used to walk all this, all these hills, just to waste time so I don't go home. I used to come up here and get high. Or I used to come up here and um, test out my guns. There was a time where I was really high and um, I just didn't care about the world. I hated the world and I thought the world was, that was why I was the way I was. And I used to shoot at the freeway, shoot at everybody down there. Yeah, scandalous, huh? That bridge, there's a park down below it. Well, that bridge, we were coming out of the projects and there was probably a lot, a lot of people out of that projects came out. If it wasn't for my big mouth, we wouldn't have got jumped. Because they said, where are we from? I said, Vicky's Town. And they said, Vicky's Town, yeah. They go, they said their neighborhood. Then after they said their neighborhood, they say, well, you know what? They diss Vicky's Town. After they diss Vicky's Town, I looked at them. I looked at my, my, um, my homegirls and my sister. And they were looking at me like, man, you know, we're in their neighborhood. And what am I going to do? And I just looked at them and said, you know what? Fuck your neighborhood. And boom, they all rushed us. The rush is like, like, like sh flies on. Sh <laughs> and then they're talking about they're gonna kill us. I'm still here. Out of tw thir more than 30 people, you would imagine. I would just one person. You know what I mean? Just one person could kill you. They didn't kill you. They're you're in their neighborhood, especially when I diss their neighborhood. And as many as them, there's a lot of them. There's only five of us. What a trip, huh? Wendy feels that her attraction to fighting comes from conflicts at home. A lot of negative things at home. My parents were down on me. I was always called stupid. And that kept me going, because when every time I would hear that, I let, got put down, I built up this anger in me and got so mad and just go back out in the streets and I release it. This is the street right here where I brought my little sister. Took her on a drive-by. Came pulled up right here on the corner right here. Got off the car, started shooting. After I started shooting, I was shooting, shooting. They came, they were in the middle of the street. We were all just shooting at each other. And took off. My little sister was sitting there screaming and crying. And I just, come on, eat your candy, eat your candy. I didn't want her to cry. She was scared, though. I wasn't thinking of my little sister at the time. I was mad. The fact my parents left her with me. And I was only a teenager. I didn't know how it was to really have a kid. Wendy became a mother at age 18. Her son was soon taken from her by the Department of Social Services because she was being beaten by her boyfriend and was abusing drugs. I would use every day. I used to go and sell, I used to go and um, jack people, or I used to beat up people or gunpoint people for money just for drugs. Just for drugs, man. It was real sick where I started getting real skinny looking like a base head. Real ugly. Wendy has left the gang. Now 21, she works part-time at a fast food restaurant and struggles to stay off drugs. Her younger sister is still active in the gang, and Wendy worries about her safety. I think that one day, shh. Maybe she'll get shot. I'm real close to her. I get scared when she's out there. When she was 13, Muau, also known as Shy Girl, joined the Vicky's Town gang. In her six years as a gang member, she has been shot, stabbed, and beaten by rivals, yet continues to fight back. 
I know I'm stubborn. Like a lot of times these things like this happen when I'm walking through my rival neighborhood. They jump me or last time they busted my head open for walking through the neighborhood. They tell me, you know, get out of their neighborhood and I just laugh at them. Buau's bravado makes her the continual target of rival gangs. She takes pride in the number of attacks she has withstood. But recently, one attack turned deadly. Three weeks ago, I got dropped off in my neighborhood at the park. A couple of my homeboys came up. They were kicking with me. I were walking towards the front of the park. They started blasting at us. A couple of my homeboys ran and I just started yelling at my neighborhood. And I was throwing up my signs and yelling out Vicky's town and you know, you dissing, you know, dissing them. From there, that's how I got shot in my arm, which is right here. The bullet went through here, and it came out through here, right here. And my turn around, and I looked, and one of my homeboys, he was laying there on the floor. What happened? I go, you're right, and I seen a bullet hole right in his chest. I was sitting there, I was trying to help him, and sitting there, and I was like, man, I couldn't believe that I never seen I never had a person die right there in my arms. And I was just trying my hardest to help him. Or there was nobody around. So I, I laid him down and I told him, just be strong, you know. I went to go call you know, ambulance and stuff and came back and tried to help him and stuff, but it was too late. I couldn't do nothing about it. They made me go to the hospital. I didn't want to go. I don't like going to the hospital. It takes forever. It takes up my time. You know, I could be doing something else besides sitting in the hospital, waiting for them to heal me. Because at the times when I did get shot, most of the time I was just buzzing. And like, it just felt like a little pinch. I got stabbed one time too. And I didn't feel that either. Well, I felt it, but then it was like, whatever, it didn't matter. It didn't really hurt me. It was just like whatever, it was like a little sting and that's it. But then at that time I had to go to the hospital because um, I had to get stitches. It was like right here behind my ear, like that, and they stabbed me like that. They tried to stab me like that, stab me like that, but they didn't get the chance to. And this is when I was getting in a fight in my rival neighborhood. And then the last time, like, they bust my head open, and I had to go to the hospital for that. But I never went back to go take out the stitches. I took them out myself. Buau and her sister Wendy grew up in a family of five girls. Their father, a former Marine and a longshoreman, describes himself as a strong disciplinarian and believed his girls should be able to protect themselves. Well, I'll be talking to my girls, telling them how to hit. Said the most delicate wrist can knock a big dude back. And keep that wrist straight. Always. Instead of like you see girl fight, they just slap like this or grab the hair. Where they could be able to get down and just and hit like a man. My father, he did hit me all you know, he hit all of us. And he used to beat us all the time. It didn't matter. He's like, for us, we always stuck together. Muau and Wendy followed their older sister into the gang. Like most girls who join gangs, they choose to dress like the male gangsters. Dressing like a girlish type or anything like that, it's, it was never me. I would dress like a guy, in other words. I'd just slick my hair back and just, you know, put my hair in a braid or just kick it. To me, I would lick just like a guy. And when I go through my rival neighborhood, I just walk, it, to me, the only thing that goes through my mind is, you gotta be down for yours, no matter if they pull out a gun on you, or what, or they try to stab you or jump you. Moao shows no fear when walking into situations where she might encounter a rifle, though she never carries a gun. 
be down for your neighbor is like you you don't give a fuck. You like you're down for your neighbor as in what can I say? Like if somebody wants to fight you or jump you, you know, you gotta be down with you, you gotta, you know, go against them. So in other words, you gotta be brave. Being down is being brave. As for me, I there's no way of avoiding me getting jumped by guys or getting shot up by guys, stabbed by guys because they just don't really care. They, most of the guys that see me, they think that I'm a guy. So, and when they find, they do find out that I'm a girl, they just, it doesn't really go through their mind. It's like, it just, they don't care. So in other words, you can't really avoid any of the guys jumping you or shooting at you or anything like that. At times I would go to the, my rival neighborhood and I would just yell out my neighborhood, Vicky's Town, it's all about Vicky's Town, what's up? Come on now, you know, come out to play. I do it for for fun and just to have some action. It's when I get bored, I just like, I just go out there and I may be causing trouble, but hell, I already got, we don't even get along with them, so what's the use, of, you know? So hell, I just go and if something happens, it just happens. While she's on the street, Muau keeps up the image of a young warrior. But since the death of her friend just three weeks before we met her, she's been writing poems that reveal a different side of her. As I sit here, all I can see is pretty much a blur, wondering what may happen in my future. As I think to myself, if I keep walking down this dark path, always remembering all the bad things that happened in my past, as a few good memories pass through my mind, I come to believe this dark path I walk, I'm soon going to find. Myself laying in a dark black hole, thinking to myself, why didn't I listen to what I was told? As the pain inside me is not letting me be free, I don't know where to turn to or who to turn to. So as I sit in my room feeling down and blue, I always wish I could die. So I don't have to feel the tears that come down my eyes. And so I don't feel the pain in my heart that is just tearing me apart. And that's one of the poems that I wrote. And when I'm, I don't know, whenever I sit in there and I have nothing to do, I just sit there and I'll write. La Lista is 18. She was just released after half a year in custody for gun possession. She's left a trail of enemies from her drug dealing and feels it would be dangerous to reveal her identity. But she agreed to tell her story and record her raps for this broadcast. So there it was, a logical explanation, giving me reason for my criminal occupation addiction. I got jumped in and I was young, I was, um, you know, I was 14 and I was still trying to hide it from my parents because I was like, I didn't want them to know. And so basically I just go, oh, I'm spending the night at, um, you know, my friend's house and we're gonna go to the movies, we're gonna go here. And every time we do that, we just be in the neighborhood till like six in the morning, not even having no place to sleep or nothing, we just be kicking it. And I like being like when it's dark, when you're on the streets and you're standing on a street corner and everyone's just, drinking, partying. I wanted to go down like so bad all the time. I wanted to be seen, I wanted to be known. I wanted to be like, like not just like, oh, you know, she's just there. I wanted to put in work to get a name. Eventually my parents found out that I was from a gang and then after that I was just like, whatever. You know, they're gonna know anyway, so I just went all full on into it. Cuba, Le Bastos, Cholos, and Greeks. Yo soy la lista and I'm Kicking it loca in the city of LA. Every night and day. Oh, I got a lot of flack from my mom, man. That's why I ran away when I was young, because she was tripping out on my hair. She started beating me with the hairbrush and she started spitting in my face. She screamed at me, she goes, I'm gonna make your life a living hell. And I was like, 
man, I was like, oh, I never forgot that. I forget a lot of things. I black a lot of things out, but I'll never forget that. And after that, boom, I jammed. That's when I went to stay with my old man. It was my luck that he lived nearby, so I said, that, I'm gonna make the school my guy. Three months later, we hooked it up, and then I moved into his pad, and we started to he was the first and only vato who had ever been with me He was the lucky one I let take my virginity I was naive and young, but it was lots of fun If there was anyone who instigated, I was the one I'm like, oh, you know, got this little fantasy world Like, we're gonna be together And he ended up getting all, man, so many times he's gotten shot up I used to take care of him And they put the gauze on him and all that stuff And he'd clean his wounds and all that And it was like, I kept telling him, like Come on, you know, I was like, let's just stop, let's stop Let's have it just be us And he was like, he would, like, he was doing it half ass. Like, he'd be like, yeah, you know, I want to be with you, but then I want to do this. And then, you know, once you're with the homeboys and everything, all the hyenas, you start partying, and he started messing up. And I was like, ah, it drove me insane. It's how it all starts, and that's how it ends. And then he walks down on you for one of your friends. We were together about a year and a couple of months. While I was loving him, he was stabbing other well, I'll tell you what happened and what I did. I wrapped my hands around his neck and squeezed as hard as I could. He couldn't believe what a monster he made. It was a thin line between love and hate. I think guys get respect when it comes to money, like selling drugs. And I think they also get respect, like, you know, if they, you know, got a lot of highness, like if they got a lot of girls they mess with and who can bring the most hoochies or hood rats down in the neighborhood. I don't know. Girls, it's like, it's hard to even be respected because point blank, it's like, they just automatically assume, ah, she's got a snatch, she's a girl, whatever, disrespect right off the bat. But I wanted respect. I was determined to get respect. When I started selling, I started selling crack. So I would sell to the kids at school. I got a few of them hooked, I feel kind of bad. When I brought it to a new level, I started going down in my neighborhood and slanging in the motels. And you know, I met some people over there and went on to bigger, better things. I was pretty solo when it came to making money. Like I would do my own operations. I would do my own things because I didn't want, I, don't, I didn't want my homeboys to know what I had. Yeah, I was from my neighborhood and it was all about my neighborhood and I was always representing and I would say I did everything for my neighborhood or cause my neighborhood, but I was really actually doing it for myself. Cause I know a lot of them, they don't give a damn. You know, they don't care. I'm just, you know, just another, another homegirl. The incident when I got busted with the gun, I was kicking it with my homeboys. We, you know, we were just walking down to the liquor store to get something to drink, and then that's when the cops just swooped up on us, and then they just caught me with the gun in the back of my pants, and I was like, ah. Lalista was 17, and she was sent to a juvenile boot camp. Now on probation, She's not allowed to associate with any gang members. That's what's depressing about being out is because I don't got no friends. It's hard because you ain't got nothing to do. You ain't have you don't have any like support or love or like anything like that. And you know, we all need friends, you know what I'm saying? It's mm -hmm. it's 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 a messed up life to not trust anybody and not have friends. It's like I'm busted, you know, you can't trust nobody, you can't have no friends. You'd think you'd make friends in this world, but you just, dang, it's hard. The lure of the gangster lifestyle isn't limited to actual gang members. Today, the danger and excitement of that life is celebrated in rap, in films, and in fashion, where it's slavishly copied by young people without gang affiliation. As a result, many young women who are not in a gang still choose to socialize exclusively with gang members. When I was in kindergarten, I would always look at the guys that would get in trouble and not the ones that would be all quiet and shy. I would always like to, you know, get with the, with the, <laughs> I don't bad. Know, with the bad crowd. I never liked being all innocent. I don't know why. They just live an exciting lifestyle. <laughs> I thought it was fun. I wanted to be down, I guess. <laughs> These girls are not gang members. They're students at an alternative school in Los Angeles for teens expelled from public school. They're in a writing and video production class designed as a part of this broadcast. Their assignment is to write about the influence that gangs have on their lives, 
and then to tape a video diary of their interaction with gangs. Does anybody, when, when you take a camera home... Oh! <laughs> their first scene illustrates the way they meet guys from other neighborhoods by going to a busy street and kicking it, hanging out, waiting for the boys to come to them. Say hi to the camera. They could be like so into looking at us that they'll just turn around with the quickness. They don't even see if there's cops around or nothing. Mm -hmm. That's how they are. Some guys are like that. <laughs> they always had something for me to do, somewhere to go with them. And they were always willing to come over here and we drink together or something. And it was just exciting. <laughs> Who's your homeboy over there? Hello. They had a camera. <laughs> Go on the one to you. Where are you going? Where are you from? Where? We kick it with guys from the valley. We kick it with guys from El Monte. We kick it with guys from La Puente. We kick it with guys in LA. We kick it with everybody. Mm -hmm. I kick it with Taggers, Bloods, Crips, and Esses. Some who I could never have in the room at the same time, or even mention around others. Put it this way, we're friendly. I kick it with everybody. <laughs> hey, you don't remember me? The girls are that are not in the gangs, but they want to be with a guy who is a gang member, it's, it's exciting for them. It's adventurous. And they feel like, yeah, you know, they feel special in some weird way. They feel special. They feel good about themselves. <laughs> I pretty much got like respect from all of his friends just being his girlfriend. They were like, oh, you know, that's his girl. So that's how I got involved. We do our raids and we do searches and we find all these pictures. You will find these bald headed guys with some beautiful girls from another area, another county. And, oh yeah, that's my girlfriend. And you know they don't match, but money cannot Now in custody, Sylvia reflects on the girls who partied girls with her neighborhood gang and they're trying to fit in. They're trying to be different. They don't want to be like their family, uh, have, you know, with the good little life like that. They want to come and join us. But it's like, when they're part of us, I, I, for me, I look at them like, what are you doing here? I think it's dangerous. It's always dangerous. Whether it's being shot or your heart being broken because a guy got killed when you weren't around him. Well, it is, you know, because you could get shot or something, but like something, like mostly when we're in that, the guys be like, oh shit, come here, you know, they'll, they'll protect us. They'll you know? take us away. They'll take from... a bullet for, in, like, just by saving us. But even Evelyn knows that it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes, like one of my homeboys, he was with some girl, and they, um, I guess they tried to kill him, but they killed her. They shot her like in the head like three times. But thanks to God, nothing has happened. Like nothing, that's good. Shootings and broken hearts are not the only dangers facing girls who party with gang members. They also face fierce competition from the gangster girls. They come with their car, their money, everything. And I'm like, oh, wow, you're going to be with us? Come on, let's go buy some beer. I use them because I don't see, it's no need for them to be with us. They have their family. Go back to your family. I have a lot of problems with girls because of the guys and the gangs that I kick it with, you know. They'll think that, like, I'll be friends with their boyfriends and things like that, and they won't like that, thinking that I'm messing with them or trying to take them from them. Or... Simone's conflict with gang girls got her expelled from school as she reveals in her class essay. Well, halfway through my ninth grade year, I got into some shit with some girls that had gangster families. Got blown out of hand, and I brought a gun to school. A semi-automatic 9mm Glock, 16 in the clip, one in the chamber. I was ready to go to war with those bitches, and it was all set up for after school that day. Now that I think about it, I was so lucky to get caught, or else I'm sure I'd be in jail on some murder charges. It cost me a lot. It cost me... A big dent out of my life, I guess, you know. I was in a good school, and this college that I wanted to go to, like, they said, like, 70% of the kids that graduate from there get accepted straight to that college. So I messed up big time. 
set me back about three, four years of my life. Sylvia Sanchez is serving time for a murder committed when she was just 16. In court, she offered no defense, made no testimony. Even her defense attorney found her uncooperative. She sat through her trial looking detached and unmoved. Now she's serving 25 years to life. After hearing her story, you may question whether Sylvia should be serving time for this crime. But she was not convicted by accident. She is one of an estimated 65,000 American girls swept up in the world of gangs. Well, started acting hard at the age of 13. But I started looking hard like when I was like around 14. That's when I dyed my hair, started doing my feathers, my big, you know, earrings, my makeup deep, and supposedly our cat eyes, our dark lipstick. Um, our big pants, we'll dress like a guy, we'll dress a gangster guy, and you know, walk the streets like, you know, you see little girls, of course you'll push them, and you know, you know they won't say nothing because they're scared of you because you look like a gangster, and you, you know, you must be carrying something with you, and most of the time I was. Now at the age of 19, Sylvia has spent the past three years thinking and writing about the events that put her behind bars. 213, that's the area where I grew up, you know, where I did all my stuff, the neighborhood where I was growing up in. When I was like in the sixth grade, I was ditching with gangster guys and then I started dressing like that. And I started getting my tattoos, leaving home. When I was like 14, I was like into it all, really into it. My tattoos, the guys, my clothes, my money. At the age of 15, I started being into the drugs and the guys. Uh, the fun in the game was who's gonna be with who today? My best friend, oh, you don't want your boyfriend no more? Nah, I want I want his brother. And that was, a, you know, what goes like a little game. All right, I'll have him, I'll be with him. Yeah, and then I'm gonna like back off then because I want the brother. But by age 15, Sylvia had found a guy she wanted to keep. He was 20. I would do everything he tells me to do. He wanted money, I'll be like, oh, right, I'll go get you your money. He's all like, how you gonna get it? You ain't even, you know, you don't even work. I'll go, I'll get it for you. And, um, you know, I'll use one of my homegirls, one of the little ones, and I'll be like, hey, I need this money, this and that, and they'll get it for me. Then I'll give it to him. My boyfriend, like, I guess I was like so in love with him that anything he said, I did. He'll say, um, Sylvia, you could only talk to me on the phone. If anyone, anyone else calls, you know, you better hang up. And he wasn't even around and I'll do it. And I guess I was just like, I had a fear that he would leave me. And I knew all my friends wanted him. And you know, they always say how cute he was. And I was glad I had him. I was like, I'm not gonna let go of him. And then he'll say, no, you can't go out with your friends. And even my friends stopped talking to me because I was listening to him too much. And then it's just like, it wasn't fun no more. Seeing how his homeboys will get drunk and he'll get real drunk and then he'll say, oh, so we'll go home, go home. And I'll be like, oh, okay, I'll go home. And I'll walk by myself in the, like, one o'clock in the morning to my house. And I was like, damn, why am I allowing this thing? And then I'll go back and he was with the girl. That's why he sent me home. And then I'll be like, all right, I'm going out too. And then he'll hit me, and then he'll say he was sorry and that he didn't do it. He'll say, I don't, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And then I'm like, yeah, whatever. I mean, I had blood in my mouth and I mean, it's like stuff like that. The crime that put Sylvia Sanchez in prison occurred just after her 16th birthday. She went to the beach, drinking with her boyfriend and five other friends. A bizarre plan was hatched to steal the car stereo of their friend who drove them to the beach. Then the plan went wrong. My boyfriend took him down over there by the water. They started fighting and he stabbed him 17 times. And he killed him and left him there. When he left him there, he still wasn't dead. Cause I, I turned back when my boyfriend told me to run. I turned back and I, then I seen him, the man was trying to walk. And I seen him when he fell. So, and we took off in his car. We parked the car close by my house. 
and he sent me home and he told me I better not say nothing or else he was gonna kill my little brother. So I didn't, I never said nothing about it. I never, not even my parents. Three months later, you know, I get arrested and they, they're accusing me of that. I was so mad and he wouldn't speak up and say he did it. And I wasn't gonna speak out because you know, you don't wanna get that rep of being a rata. So you're not gonna rat. So I didn't say nothing, and even though the cops and the detectives saying they were telling me, you know, you're gonna go down for this, you're gonna get life without parole if you don't say who it was, I still wasn't gonna say nothing. I thought I'm young, they can't do this to me. I'm only 16, and and you know, things started going wrong, and we were, in, you know, we started going to court. He started brainwashing me, giving me letters every day in court. You know, sneaking in letters, giving them to me, and I'll be like, oh, he loves me, he loves me. Even though I knew, you know, he was lying. In a way, I thought, I knew he was lying, but I didn't want to believe it. And then things just got worse and worse, and he would just try to make it up with a card and telling me, look, so I did this for you, and I'm all like, yeah, whatever. They came when we got found guilty. And when we got found guilty, his letter stopped. And my last letter, I remember what I wrote. I remember I telling him, did you ever love me? Do you love me? Did you ever care for me? And like stuff like that. And I go, if you did, please answer my letter. And he never answered. Okay, ladies, moving in the unit. Sylvia has served the first part of her sentence in Juvenile Hall. She hopes to get her tattoos removed before she is transferred to an adult women's prison. I'm getting removed all my visible tattoos, my face, my neck, my arms, my back, and I'm removing one in my chest, my ex-boyfriend's name, the one I'm in here for. It hurts a lot because they're burning your skin. So is that laser treatment, they said it don't hurt, but it does. It smells, it's painful. You know, sometimes we have to have the patient come back seven or eight times to get all of the tattoos out. The main thing that was going through my mind was that I'm leaving my past behind and starting a new life, but in a way it's painful to let go of my old self, but it's something I must do in order to improve myself. At the Los Angeles Juvenile Hall, Sylvia is now taking a class in creative writing, led by writer Karen Hunt. Think about what that thing was that you saw in your mind that was keeping you from going into that little cottage, that place that you really want to be, and write about that. You see it in the writing, there's a great amount of conflict between being tough and being a girl. Where, well, if you're a girl, you can't be tough, but you have to be tough in order to survive, and they're very confused about those two, you know, clashing against one another. So they work through a lot of that in the writing. If you look at Silvio, you see a chola, a loca chola. You see a girl with tattoos all over her body, your first impression of her is someone that if I had seen her on the street, uh, she would have made me nervous. I'd walk to the other side of the street. I wouldn't want to confront her. But there's somebody else beneath that, which she was afraid to let out. Because to be this kind of a girl, to live in the environment that she lives in, you have to be tough. That's how you survive. When I first met Sylvia, she was very withdrawn, um, very surly, very defiant, scared. She kept very much on her own. And in the beginning, she couldn't write. She didn't believe that she had anything important to say. She didn't believe she had value. But over time, as she began to open up and start to evaluate herself, she realized that she could start thinking deeply about issues. And that's when she really began to change. But as it was about to bite me, it turned to a man, a man I seen before. He slapped me, I cried, I recognized Her lawyer him. said, I can't get through to her. She, she shows no remorse, she's not, 
she won't open up to me. And, um, and when I gave her attorney Sylvia's writing, she said, I never knew this about this girl. Now I see her in a completely different light. This man, as I was about to call out his name, he disappeared along with the bad feeling inside of me. Sylvia's newfound ability to communicate came too late to help in her legal defense. She and her five friends were all convicted of first-degree murder. Since her sentencing, Sylvia has earned her high school diploma and now awaits her transfer to a women's prison. I'm nervous, but I'll make it. I'm a strong woman, and I'm not a weak little girl. This little girl grew up to be a strong-minded woman. It's hard. Life is hard outside this walls and inside this walls. People have always put me down, made me walk with the face hanging low, called me names, made me cry, made my childhood a nightmare, and even took my life away. But now I walk straight up, my head up in the sky, because even though I'm in my best situation, I make the best of it by getting my education and getting all A's. And most of all, because I still carry a big smile on my face, because finally I found the masterpiece inside of me. As we completed this inside story, Sylvia had served three years of her 25 years to life sentence. Wendy's car was impounded because she was driving it without legal registration. It's now difficult for her to get to work. And it's a two hour bus ride to visit her son. Right now I just try to finish my like drug classes. I see him on the weekends, sometimes during the weekends, weekdays. Muao was picked up with a group of gang members in violation of the terms of her probation. She was sent to Juvenile Hall for three days, then released to a stricter probation. Because you know you can't miss not one day of school. I know. And you so can't you be out on the street. Only if it was an emergency. And you can't be out on the street. I can't see you out in the street on the weekends or at night. Though Muao will be under house arrest for another month, she shows no intention of leaving her gang. In my future, I just think if I keep on, you know, gang banging, I'm gonna either end up dead or paralyzed or who knows. To me, gang banging, either you die or you get paralyzed, something bad happens. And no matter what, if you're in, in a gang, you always something bad happens to you. And I figured after messing around after a couple years, I figured I'd give it up. But I sunk in deep, and I couldn't get out. Lalista like, has been out of custody for three months. She's performing her mandatory community service by speaking to teens about her life of crime. I took advantage while I was in jail. I got my GED. I took a college course and scored three. I got three units. I got an A in the course. It was a sociology class, and it taught me about about family, love, marriage, relationships, and I learned a lot about myself. I can express feelings better to people now. I'm not as cold and hardened up. And I'm trying to change, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to put everything in the past. You know, I got a legit job now. I work two jobs. You know, I'm gonna put myself through school in a couple months. It's like, I'm trying to become, now that I've gotten out, I'm trying to become what they call a productive citizen. I'm trying to change. Many of the women in this program joined gangs believing that it was their only means of survival in a dangerous world. Today they realize that gang life holds no future. The price for this insight is high. Incarceration. Friends lost to drugs or death. These gangster girls are only a small part of the rising trend of criminality among women. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, the number of women in America's prisons and jails has climbed by a startling 72% in the last decade.